said your name, uh, your first name, your name is T. Yeah. yeah, I'm Ole Johansson and I'm coming from Stockholm, Sweden, where I work at the Karolinska Institute heading the experimental dermatology unit. You are a pioneer in this uh, kind of research. Mm -hmm. we, we will do a very short, uh, you can um, indicate and, and say uh, as, as short as you can. I will try to, okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, we have to be um, worried about uh, um, the consumers shouldn't have to be, but people in power and in charge must be worried based upon the science that is around, yes. What is the, um, biologically speaking, what is the effect of the radiation in, in human biology? Yeah, um, Scientists have studied, for instance, effects on the immune system, effects on the fertility, the sperm cells and egg cells, and effects on DNA, cancer, etc. And to make a long story short, they see a number of associations, some of which that are scary today, but also in the long term. And there could be generation effects coming in our children or grandchildren or grand grand grandchildren and so on. You said that um, fertility can um, fall a lot in two generations. Yes, and there are already very detailed studies on mice, for instance, clearly showing this. And that would mean that you have a dramatic drop in fertility in 150 years' time because of something we did today. But this is a hypothesis, it's a, it's a fact already. Um, the fact you will have in 150 years' time, and then it's too late to say you're sorry. Uh, it's an hypothesis, uh, and it's driven by published, peer-reviewed-based scientific studies. So you have pieces already, quite a few pieces of this jigsaw puzzle and hopefully it will turn out to be completely wrong and that it is safe but in the meantime while we are discussing this uh, we are exposing everyone 24-7 wherever they are to something that in laboratories give extremely scary effects. I, I assume that in, in Sweden you are a pioneer of this, you and my colleagues. <coughs> in other countries uh, there are a lot of people doing this kind of research. Oh yes, uh, you know from the very beginning I was more or less the only one. Uh, but then I discovered that in other countries there were scientists doing similar investigations and uh, after years we got together and started to communicate but of course today the number of scientists in this field is exploding there is so many scientists everywhere so the interest is huge and the uh, worry also oh yes yes indeed so yes and you also see that more and more governments do take very tough precautionary measures uh, like in Germany, for instance, the government has said that one should avoid using Wi-Fi. In Belgium, they are going to um, stop the introduction next year in March to children and teenagers, and so on, so on, so on. So measures are taken, and also the World Health Organization has cancer classified both radiofrequent fields as well as power frequent magnetic fields. So if they would have been safe, they have a special class for that, then they could have put them there, but they didn't. They said these are possible carcinogenics. And actually for the power frequent magnetic fields, which is a long word for household electricity, if it should be redone today, uh, then it most likely would end up as a probable carcinogen. <clears throat> what amount of research have to be done? To, to precise, more precise. Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, you can look 
or conduct from different angles, actually there is no more need for research. The number of publications is overwhelming. There is so many papers. So to have a moratorium, to have a stop, uh, it's enough. Uh, and then, of course, if you stop this exposure, then you won't risk humans, animals, plants, and so on, bacteria. And um, if you decide to continue, and the European Parliament has said that, that immediate measures must be taken, not tomorrow, but today. And one such measure would be to immediately assure uh, a general and profound um, uh, amount of funding for research so that uh, sort of needle point studies, the really important ones, can be replicated, double checked, triple checked, and so on, you know. Which are the worst technologies? Oh, <laughs> um, the, the, the microphone, the telephone, the cell telephone, the Wi Fi, the Wi Fi, or which? The thing is, you see, that we don't see any real difference because the exposure levels are astronomically high from all of them. Uh, and they do differ, of course, in the various physical aspects. And some of them you keep closer to yourself, some are more distant, and there are indications that maybe it's worse to have a gadget close to yourself than very far away. So that would pinpoint, for instance, mobile phones, wireless indoor telephones, and uh, iPads and that kind of things. Uh, but we know too little to really answer that. You are worrying um, about one thing that is increasing. Uh, like uh, this, yeah. There, there's no... Uh, the, the, young, the industry and the, the technology uh, has not um, doing nothing in according with what you are saying. Um, well, they have. Uh, but that is not known to the general public. The telecom industry, for instance, has applied for patents based upon cancer risks. But they don't want that to be publicized or uh, talked about. So they do take measures. And also you have to remember that operators and manufacturers have written in their licenses and agreements with governments and parliaments special paragraphs where they say they do not take any responsibility. Uh, insurance companies do not insure you for health effects from illuminated fields. And when you buy a telephone, it clearly says that you must keep it at least one inch away from your body. At the moment you take it out of the box, you have violated that instruction. So therefore you can never find them in any way. And uh, legal experts also say that from a legal point of view, uh, the persons that are in charge are actually the governments and the parliaments and the health authorities. Because these telecom operators, they only ask the governments and parliaments if it's all right to hold body ready to the general population 24 seven, wherever they are. And the governments and parliaments said, yes, that's what we want. So the responsibility and liability claims will have to be met by the society. And 2004 in London, we were at the meeting, and then um, lawyers and experts from the telecom sector said openly, they don't take any responsibility. They want to have the profit and the future costs they give to society. And they were very clear, very honest about that. Uh, so, but not uh, made a press conference about it. Uh, <laughs> there wasn't anyone present from the press, which I think, in a way, was a pity. But all the things I described to you now has been in all the world's press media: television, radio, newspapers, journals, magazines, and so on. But you know, people are so very occupied with their smartphones, so they never have time to really read, see, or listen to what, for instance, you give them. Uh, if you listen to television news, uh, then you should be shocked. But people never are because they are occupied with some app or play or whatever they are doing, you know. And the last weeks in Sweden have been an enormous discussion because parents are so occupied with the smartphones so that they neglect their kids, 
and there have been a number of instances where kids have run away out in the streets and so on, and the parents have been doing this, and also the parents themselves have got killed, and they have been going on a bicycle, looking at this, and been run over by a truck and immediately killed. And therefore, in Sweden, there is a debate how sort of catched into this should you allow yourself to be, especially if you are a parent. <clears throat> a very, very recent uh, issue. Yeah. And we have to adapt to this. Yeah. And yeah. Sure and but it is interesting because, as we talked about before, if you would interview me in 1955, then smoking was on the rise enormously. You and I, we would have been smoking, and uh, everyone would have been smoking. But nowadays in Sweden, it's very uncommon to see a smoker, and you are basically completely forbidden to smoke. Uh, a lot of indoor facilities are completely forbidden, but now also outdoor facilities, you are not allowed to smoke while you wait for a bus, for instance. And if we would have talked about that in 1955, we would have said, no, there is no way to stop this. And suddenly now, it is practically stopped, you know. So, of course, alterations and changes in society can happen very quickly, both the introduction of something as well as the real reduction. And hopefully, I'm completely wrong, hopefully it will turn out that these techniques based on electromagnetic fields and signals are completely safe. But then you see thousands and thousands of peer review based scientific publications must all be wrong. And that has never, ever happened in science before. Some of them will be wrong, most likely, but not so many at the same time. So research is crucial, and publishing it more crucial. It is, and of course, um, you, you need to develop knowledge all the time, and the society tool we use for that, we call it science. And therefore, we have governmental scientists employed by universities. And they should work free and independently and not be dependent on like money from the industry or the finance world or anything like that. But therefore, we pay taxes. And we should allow them as some kind of mental fire brigade soldiers to immediately investigate these questions. And, and I don't want to take away anything from the population if they want to stream videos and add up movies and internet information, they should. But maybe it should be done using wired shielded cabling instead. The information will be the same. It will be the same things, but maybe without all this wireless radiation. Cable radiation doesn't radiate? It's shielded, like you use a lot in the television world and to avoid disturbances. And so you can have shaded cabling that doesn't leak electromagnetic fields, at least not in the microwave range. Mm, Wi-Fi in schools is probably the most uh, worrying issue. Uh, not in schools, but in schools and in homes, because you have a double exposure there. And again, you can have it in a cable, wide shielded way, the kids will get the same. But there you have an additional question, does this really add anything of value from a pedagogic point of view? And in Sweden, you know, children have been given everything. Every child has everything, every gadget you can imagine, wireless. And at the same time, the learning level in Sweden has gone dramatically down. It's actually a national crisis. The last public discussion between the political leaders dealt for one third of the time with this. It's a real crisis in the teaching system, in spite of the fact they have all these iPads and smartphones and whatever, but they're getting dumber and dumber and dumber, you know, in Sweden. Not here, but in Sweden. You have done research for many years, but now it probably you feel yourself yeah. A researcher, but also uh, um, a divulgator, I don't know how to explain in English, uh, uh, a person who 
who his um, uh, main uh, work is divulgate the, 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 the research, the, the results of the research. Um, you mean that my life has been devoted to research, or? But now you are um, a public uh, person. Oh. Who well, who now I am for a few minutes, <laughs> but yeah, you know. No, there you know. No, no, no. I'm not such a public for figure. But you have this, this, this uh, you are doing this work, explaining what, uh, because you are concerned with Oh, of course. And you know, at the Karlis Institute in Sweden, which is a governmental authority, actually, it's paid by taxpayers' money. And it says that we should do research, we should teach uh, for people that want to become dentists and doctors, but we should also engage in public information and discussion. And they are equally large, these pieces of the cake. And very few actually engage in the information bit, uh, but I very often uh, I am contacted by reporters, journalists, and concerned parents. The parents are the most common call I get, uh, asking, is this really safe for my child or not? And then I say, don't trust me, but I will send you information, and you can read for yourself, think, read more, think, read more, and finally come up with a solution for your own family and you'll have to live by that. But if you decide to use all these gadgets, and at the same time, the learning level of the kid goes down, the health goes down, don't accuse me. I try to inform you. That's all right. <laughs> Uh, you know, when you are irradiated with microwaves from like the camera here, <laughs> uh, yes. the mic. Yeah, you get an impairment of short term memory. I'm not kidding. No, no. Yeah. You know, this lady behind the camera, yeah. she's heavily exposed yeah. because this is a radio frequency device. Yeah. It can communicate with the microphone and so on, you know. You say you may be wrong. Yes, but hopefully. But you don't believe you are wrong. You know, beliefs are more in philosophy and religion. Uh, I'm a dull or in Swede, and we believe in very few things actually, you know, and therefore I trust facts. And when I look on the pile of facts, I get pretty scared and pretty shocked. And I'm amazed that people so willingly allow themselves and their children to be whole body radiated 24-7 for the rest of their life, and at exposure levels that are biblical, that are enormously high, you know. And again, when you go to the scientific literature, the effects we are talking about are quite scary, many of them. And when I'm out giving lectures, I ask the audience, if you use a mobile phone, do you want to have a brain tumor? No one says, yes, I want to have that. And then I say, well, wait, I have a second question. There are very well controlled scientific data showing that if you use a mobile phone, you get more headaches. Do you want to have headaches from your mobile phone? And so far, no one has said they want to have them. So we don't need to sort of talk about the scary effects like cancer. It's enough to mention headaches. And then people say, no, I don't want to have that. Well, you get it statistically from using the mobile phone. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. Do you know Elizabeth Gavis? Yes, I don't know her, but I know who she is. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah. But that's in another field, the uh, cancer epidemiology, which is a very complicated field, you know. Yeah, do you participate in, in, uh, in the... In the book? No. no. You know, that's about epidemiology. Yeah. And you know, epidemiology, as it is done classically, it will arrive when the whole thing is done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's a little bit, you know, if, if you would fly over Dresden in Germany in 1945, and from the image, try to understand what happened 1920 in Germany, 
no, you just cannot, it's impossible, you know. So you need to have the prospective laboratory studies. If you had had that 1920, we wouldn't have had a Second World War. And Dresden would still have been standing. So that's the problem with uh, epidemiology, that it only knows the facts when it's too late, really. Yeah. So it describes, you know, what, what happened if we, and so on, you know. Okay. Yeah, that's true, but uh, it's a part of uh, the research. This is, is important. Uh, so to, to describe uh, general effects, yes, but not to protect. You know, in, in risk analysis, professional risk analysis never uses epidemiology, but oddly enough, in this field, only epidemiology is allowed. And you can think, as a digging journalist, why is it like that? They use a tool which you would never use otherwise. Right. Yeah. <coughs> yeah.